looks like to follow the two great commandments? What it looks like to love God and love others? Um, so the definition of a parable, uh, we heard at the beginning on the next slide, the definition of a parable is that it's a made-up story. These aren't real people who really did something. Jesus is making up a story with a hidden meaning. And if we understand the parable, the hidden meaning teaches us an important lesson. It teaches us something through story that is in a way that's more powerful than if Jesus just said, do this or don't do that. Um, we, get, we get drawn into the story so that we learn at emotional levels as well as in our mind. And all the parables are showing us something about the kingdom of God. Sometimes Jesus says kingdom of God, sometimes kingdom of heaven. But it shows us what it looks like to live in God's kingdom. Well, we're going to take a moment to remember the parables so far. First, Carly Garrett preached on the parable of the sower with the four kinds of soil. And I wonder if anyone here is willing to share one thing you remember learning or thinking about from the parable of the sower. Christos is going to pick us up. Now, Naomi, can you read that down to Christos? One thing that you remember learning or thinking about. Um, Kylie made a very interesting reading suggesting that um, we, in fact, were the sowers rather than God being the one who is saying the same. So it's incumbent on us just to um, share God's word in every circumstance and yeah, leave it up to God how he grows those crops. Awesome. And then I preached on the parable of the bigger barn. Can anyone share one thing you remember learning or thinking about when um, we talked about the parable of the man who tore down his barn and built a bigger one? <laughs> yes, don't put don't things off till tomorrow. Live every day like a nurse. Yeah, we've got a purpose for today. Use the resources we have today. Then Christos preached on the parable of the loving father and his two sons. Um, it's often known as the parable of the prodigal son. Can anyone um, share one thing you remember learning or thinking about as we heard the parable of the prodigal son? Our time, so I just appreciated how straightforward that was. Yeah, 
All right. So parables are made up stories with a hidden meaning. And as we enter the story and understand the meaning, it teaches us a really important lesson. So with that in mind, we're going to hear today's readings. Uh, firstly from the book of Jonah, and then from the book of Matthew. So the reading from Jonah, chapter 3, starting at verse 6. Jonah's morning reached the king of Nineveh. He got up from his throne and took off his royal robes. He also dressed himself in the clothes of his sadness. And then he sat down in the house. Here is the message he sent out to the people of Nineveh. I and my nobles give this order. Don't let people or animals taste anything. That includes your thirds and frogs. People and animals must not eat any, eat or drink anything. Let people and animals alike be covered with the clothing of sadness. All of you must call out to God with all your hearts. Stop doing what is evil. Don't harm others. Who knows? God might take pity on us. He might not be angry with us anymore. Then we won't die. God saw what they did. He saw that they stopped doing what was evil. So he took pity on them. He didn't destroy them as he had said he would. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. He became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Here is what Jonah said to him. Well, isn't this exactly what I thought would happen when I was still at home? That is what I tried to prevent by running away from touch. I knew that you were gracious. Uh, you were telling us in mind. You were so angry. You were full of love. You were a God who takes pity on people. You don't want to destroy them. You were taking away my life. I brought them to live. But they didn't reply. Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had left the city. He had sat down at a place east of it. There he put some branches over his head. He sat there in their shade. He waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God sent a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah. It gave him more shade for his head. It made him more comfortable. Jonah was very happy he had the leafy plant, but before sunrise the next day, God sent a worm. It chewed the plant so much that it dried up. When the sun rose, God sent a burning east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head. It made him very weak. He wanted to die, so he said, I would rather die than live. But God spoke to Jonah. God said, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, Jonah said. In fact, I'm so angry I wish I was dead. Hear the word of the Lord. So Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who owned land. He went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to give them the usual pay for a day's work. Then he sent them into his vineyard. About nine o'clock in the morning, he went out again. He saw others standing in the market doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard. I'll pay you what is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and at three o'clock and did the same thing. About five o'clock he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard spoke to the person who was in charge of the workers. He said, Call the workers and give them their pay. Begin with the last ones at high. Then go on to the first one. The workers who had hired about five o'clock came. Each received the usual day's pay. So when those who were hired first came, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received the usual day's pay. When they received it, they began to complain about the owner. 
These people who hide, who were hired last work only for one hour, they said. You have kept them the same as us. We have done most of the work and have been in the hot sun for a day. The owner answered one of them. Friend, he said, I'm being fair to you. Didn't you agree to work for the usual day's pay? Take your money and go. I want to give the one I last the same pay I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Do you feel cheated because I gave so freely to the others? So those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. Hear the word of the Lord. Thank you so much. Um, so we've got a picture, I think, of the uh, workers there in the vineyard. Um, we on that slide. Well, this is the scene. Jesus is telling a story that is of a very familiar scene to the people uh, where he's living. There's many vineyards in Israel. Um, it was a farming community. There was a system of day laborers. If you uh, be day laboring, would be a very um, uncertain kind of existence um, because each day, if you manage to get work, you would be paid enough for one day's pay. So if you didn't get work then there would not be enough for you and your family. So it was a, these are vulnerable people working day by day, and the farmer comes out, normal day, um, it's a 12 hour working day, so right, you blokes, you've all got work to visit for the day, off to my vineyard, you start work at 6 a.m. and you'll go through to 6 p.m. and you'll get the usual day's wage. Those people head off, thrilled to have a day's work. Those were left behind. You can imagine at nine o'clock, you've pretty much given up hope of having work for the day, but they're hanging around in case. And sure enough, there's more work to be done. You too can't work in my field. At 12 o'clock, they're probably thinking, well, at least a half day's pay is going to be worth it. Yes, I'll come and work a half day. There'll be some food for my family tonight. Those at three o'clock must have really given up hope of eating that night, but they get given some work. And at five o'clock, with only an hour left in the day, another group of workers get the opportunity to earn at least a little something that might help their family. Well, on the next slide, we can see that at the end of the day, when the shift was over, they lined up to be paid. Those hired at five o'clock received a denarius. Now, a denarius was a silver coin. This is a replica. It's a taken as a, from an imprint from an actual denarius that's in a museum. A silver coin like this. This was the standard day's pay. So those who worked only an hour were given a full denarius. And those who worked at three, a denarius for each one. Who started at 12, who started at nine. And those who started at six, We'd work a full 12 hours in a hot sun. They came and they were given one denarius. They were paid what they had expected at the start of the day. They were paid the agreed amount, but they were paid the same as those who'd worked only one hour. Now, I'm a human level, we can kind of understand how those 6 a.m. workers might be feeling. It doesn't seem unreasonable, does it? That if they've worked 12 hours and someone else has worked one hour, that they would get at least a little bit more. When the master says, it's my money, I can do with it what I want. What's it to you if I'm generous? We kind of identify with that feeling that it feels a little bit unfair. Is it fair? And if this is a picture of God, is God fair or unfair? This is what Jesus wants us to wrestle with today. Rather than get into the employment law of first century Israel or get into the debate about the role of unions or Fair Work Australia, we've got to remember this is a parable. More important 
than first century employment law is what Jesus is telling us about the kingdom of God through this story. God is the master. We are the workers, all given the fair reward. Now we all come to faith in Jesus at different points in our lives. On the next slide we see that some of us, like the parable of Alex, on the next slide, some of us got on board working hard for Jesus like good soil from the moment we first heard about Jesus. Like good soil, we've worked hard for Jesus and we've borne fruit for him. Some of us have spent years giving up when it was hard, have spent time getting distracted by life, like the rocky or the thorny ground. Some of us have probably been through times where we turned our back on God completely, like the seed on the path. Now, whether we produce one seed or hundreds, is it right if our place in God's kingdom is the same as each other? Some of us have had hard times where we've wandered away from God, like the prodigal son. When people who've wandered away from God come back, should they receive the same wage? Should they get the same gift from God? Jesus is giving us the answer. On the next slide, we see that some people, like that widow, pray persistently for years and years and years. And other people pray just once and get a full and complete answer to their prayer. Is that fair? Some of us have been forgiven a lot. Some of us have been forgiven less. There might be people not yet part of our church who God is calling who might need to be forgiven more than all of us put together. Is it fair that we have the same status in the kingdom of God, no matter how big or small our forgiveness has been? The parable of the unforgiving servant told us it is fair that we are forgiven fully, regardless of whether it's a big or small debt. How can this be? We think back to our Old Testament reading. We've got a picture on the mother of uh, Jonah. This is another time when one of God's people learned a similar message to the parable Jesus is telling. Jonah was a prophet of God. He was told to go to the non-Jewish city of Nineveh and tell them that God was angry with their sin and they needed to repent and say sorry to God and change. And Jonah didn't want to go because he said, if I go, they might say sorry and you might forgive them and they deserve to suffer. They deserve to be punished. I don't want to go and warn them, God. And through a series of events, Jonah eventually went to Nineveh. And he did preach God's message. And they did all repent. The king stood up and said, all of us, every one of us, are going to pray to God. We're going to stop doing evil. We're going to live God's way. We're going to ask him to change his mind and forgive us. And God did because he loves each and every person he has made, including those in Nineveh. And Jonah was angry, at least as angry as those 6 a.m. workers. He said, God, I knew this would happen. I knew you'd forgive them. They've done so much bad stuff. They don't deserve it. And God tried to show Jonah that in his love for us, for each one of us, every one of us can come back to him. Our verse of the day speaks to Jonah and his situation. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. This is a very popular Bible verse. It appears on posters, it appears in pictures, it appears on encouraging cards that you might give someone. It's a beautiful verse and a beautiful sentiment. But it speaks not just to me, 
but to you and to everybody else. It's true of you. It's true of me. It's true of the servant who is forgiven much. It's true of the people of Nineveh. They too are fearfully and wonderfully made. They too are known and loved by God. I am fearfully and wonderfully made, but no more so than any other person who God has given life to. All that I have, everything of worth that I have is a gift from God. And all that I owe, the weight of my sin, can only be lifted off me by the grace and mercy of Jesus. With this in mind, let us return to Jesus and his parables. On the next slide, we see that big barn. Jesus has shown us that the blessings he gives us are to be used to pass on to others. We're not to pour blessings for ourselves so that we can put our feet up and just rest in them. Rather, Jesus gives us stuff so that we can use them in his service, in his kingdom. And when he divided the sheep and the goats, he said, what you hold back from any other person, you hold back from me. What you use to bless any other person, you use to bless me. In the kingdom of heaven, there is an astonishing equality. Our work before God is the same. Our place before God is the same. Whether we feel like we've lived a whole life of backbreaking work, a great personal sacrifice, whether we've become a Christian at the last moment and been forgiven so much and haven't had much time left to serve God, Jesus says, all of you are welcome. All of you receive the same. The gift of eternal life. You receive my love. You receive the status of being a child of God. There is astonishing equality. What we receive from God isn't really wages. That's when you can't push a parable too far. Because what does God owe us? What does God owe me? Nothing. It's I who owe God. It's you who owe God. We owe him our lives, and it's out of his mercy and grace that we receive. This changes our notion of fair. This challenges our notion of fair. The master says, I can be as kind to others as I want. I'm not being unfair to you. Don't go looking. And others to see how you think it measures up. Know that I am fair to you and I've given you exactly what is right. Today's parable, in challenging our notion of fair, connects with us at an emotional level. Our first instinct is to share the anger of the people who worked all day. <coughs> Jonah's instinct was to be furious that the people of Nineveh would get away with their sin. So Jesus tells this story to help us connect with those emotions, to help us connect with the ways in which we judge other people, to connect with the ways we sometimes want others to suffer. We want to see people brought low who've done the wrong thing. Perhaps we feel they don't really deserve to be forgiven. Or maybe we feel like, okay, God can forgive them, but they better be second-class citizens of the church. Jesus knows our heart. He knows our failings and our self-centeredness. He knows how quickly we forget what he has done for us, what we have been forgiven. He knows how quickly we forget we could never repay our debt to God. We didn't receive the seed of the word of God in our lives because we deserved it. God sowed his seed because in his mercy and grace, he wanted us to know him. He wanted to bless us. 
he wanted to call us home. If we go to the next slide. Today's parable is a wonderful illustration of the power of parable and story, of how a parable can teach us a truth that is hard to accept. If Jesus just said, everyone's equal, and made it a propositional statement, it wouldn't impact us in the same way. But through this story, we journey through the emotions. Jesus wants us to identify our anger and our judgment, but then to come to a new place where we say, I'm not like those Pharisees. I'm going to see the kingdom through Jesus' eyes. I'm going to see that God is fair. He's fair when he pours out his mercy and grace. He has been more than fair to me, and I will rejoice at seeing his blessings given to others also. Jesus calls us to be people who say, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I praise you because each person you created is fearfully and wonderfully made. I praise you because in your mercy you don't hold our sins against us. You are not a debt collector for our sins because you've forgiven our debt and given us more blessings. I praise you because even though I'm only worthy to be your slave, you treat me as a trusted worker. You provide for me and bless me and give me good gifts. You love us and place us in community. You give us purpose. I praise you because our life has meaning as a disciple of Jesus. Can you praise God in that way? To the depths of your heart and soul, can you praise God in that way? Can you and do you authentically praise God, even for his goodness to those who have fallen very far? I think all of us have sticking points when it comes to applying this parable. I know I do. Those points where it's like, ooh, that, that's asking a lot, Jesus. Ooh, I can't have to work hard at forgiving that one. Ooh, it's not so easy to fully accept that kind of person. What are the sticking points for you? Who are the people you find it hard to see God bless? In a moment, I'm going to pray for us and then leave a moment of silence for each of us to hear from the Holy Spirit. Now, ask the Holy Spirit to show us if there are people or groups about whom our attitude has been wrong. To show us if there are people we've been treating like five o'clock workers. If there's people you've been thinking deserve less than you do. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this parable. It is challenging and hard to hear. But today we say, Lord Jesus, we are willing to hear your words. We ask that by your Holy Spirit, you will help us to accept your words and to live out your words. Holy Spirit, if there is anyone who we are holding in judgment, if there is anyone we've been unwilling to pray for that you would bless them, Lord Jesus, show that to us now. If there's anyone you want us to pray for, who we've been avoiding praying for, share that to us now. And 
as we continue to live in your kingdom. Lord, help us to have this mindset as a daily attitude of checking ourselves to make sure we're living with your mindset, with your view of what it is to love you and love others. This we ask in your name. Amen. Well, Jesus said, Friend, I'm being fair to you. Didn't you agree to work for the usual day's pay? Take your money and go. I want to give the one I hired last the same pay I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Do you feel cheated because I gave so freely to others? So those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. Hear the word of the Lord.